there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Angling websites are commonplace now in 2015, but it hasn't always been that way. There was a time, and not that long ago either, when getting up-to-date quality angling information via the internet was far from easy. A situation recognised and rectified when World Sea Fishing or WSF came on the scene, which despite being one of the pioneers of angling information, has lost none of its value or following through its features, and particularly its forum, which doubtless most anglers will have dipped into at some stage or other when thinking of buying or trying something new. So to get the first hand lowdown on both the history of the site and its future, I'm linking up here with its creator, Mike Thrussell Jr. Right, first things first. Let's clear up the name confusion, family links and running of the site, because to varying degrees there are two Mike Thrussells involved here. Um, well basically the RSF is my website and I started it in 1998. The site was actually called to see all the angles then. It was a project that I did while I had nothing to do during the summer holiday. Uh, Mike Senior was actually against the idea, but obviously when you're 16 you're a bit stubborn, and I didn't listen and I created it anyway. I asked him if I could use some of his previous articles, and he agreed to support me, but I'm not entirely sure he was all that convinced it would last very long. Uh, to clear up the confusion, WSF is my own website. While there are plenty of myths out there that Mike Senior owns the site, it is mine and all the decisions made towards its future, both for the forum, the social aspects of the site and also the editorial direction were all my own decisions as well as any commercial direction. Obviously with my dad being a very high profile journalist in the angling world and also having a lot more experience than I had when I first started, it would have been foolish not to ask for his advice. So throughout WSF's history he has always been there to offer me advice if I need it, some I take, some I don't. My role takes on much of the business, front end technical elements of running a website now that WSF is a fully-fledged media site, having shut down the retail operation, I'm also heavily involved with generating content for the site, and I try to produce at least one or two articles, reviews or guides a week if the time allows. I'm also the editor, so I collate work together from the various contributors on the site, and I put these into an online workable format. I guess as most small business owners in the UK, I practically do everything, so I also look after the marketing and the promotional aspects of the site too. The only thing I don't do is the nitty gritty server side technicals. I have a fully qualified systems administrator who looks after that side of the business for me and have done for the past three years. It's probably the best decisions I've ever made. My father's role in WSF is very different. I guess you'd call Dad the senior editorial contributor to the site and together we produce many of the how-to articles and photographs that accompany those. In addition, in between his busy schedule of writing and also his tackle consultancy with Pure Fishing, he still finds time to write the occasional article, review and blog, which I am eternally grateful for. Dad is also my go-to guy when you've been let down by a contributor or you're struggling to fill a hole with a story or anecdote. He has an uncanny ability to turn around words quicker than anybody I know, so when the chips are down I know I can rely on him to get me out of a hole. You could say that we work well together as we both help each other out. I help out a lot on the features Dad produces for the magazines by way of taking photographs and helping with the step-by guides. Whilst many people see Mike Senior's name on one or two articles a month, he also produces a ton of work that doesn't have his name on it, and these all need to have illustrated pictures, which is where I come in. Together we spend at least two days a month putting together content for the paper magazines, Dad with the writing and me with the camera, or slaving away on Photoshop. Whilst there was no force by Mike Senior, it was an inevitable career path for me. Ever since I was a small child, I wanted to be involved in the media one way or another, as a journalist or as an editor, and I think this stems from the fact that we'd often have magazine editors and journalists of the house for brainstorming sessions, and their influence would naturally rub off on me. I remember we had the editor in previous sea fishing, Chris Pierce, up at the house for a couple of days when I was 10 or 11, and I somehow managed to convince my mum that I had a cold and was too ill to attend school. It was a complete fabrication and the real reason I wanted to stay at home was to listen and help in the brainstorming. Whilst we both do very different things, we've worked together for what feels like an eternity. I've been involved in helping one way or another since I was a young kid and it's most definitely shaped what I do today. As you know, I also run a website, though very different to WSF on a number of fronts. Videos, articles and audio interviews are its main framework. Plus, I'm retired, so I can treat it as a hobby rather than a job. 
One idea I've toyed with is running a forum for people to share information on an interactive basis, something I've tended to shy away from due to its potential for abuses. But WSF hasn't, so talk us through some of your experiences there. We live in an increasingly connected world, and I think it's vitally important that communication channels are open to all who want to use them. Forums are still a vital part of the internet and are some of the highest traffic sites in the world. When it comes to abuse, in my experience of running forums, I think it's highly exaggerated. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, but it is in no way an epidemic of abuse that some of the press would like you to believe. Forums are like a big town. You get a large amount of people who just want to go about their daily lives, chat with their mates and get on with things. You get a small amount who really want to get involved and help run the town, and then you get a small minority of people who are just there to cause trouble and be on a wind-up. In the 13 or so years WSF has run as a forum, I've probably seen everything and very little of it was actually downright abusive. There have been a handful of serious incidents, but for the most part, it's been very much bagged at 50 paces, which blows over after a few days. Alcohol is usually a good catalyst. The forum is policed by a set of rules that are administrated by the moderators. Most of the moderating on WSF is done reactively, which means that if somebody flags something up to a moderator, then the moderator will go in and take a look and make a decision on that thread. The system gives all members the ability to report a post to a moderator, so there is no excuse for any member not to report something they think breaks the rules. It's very rare that the WSF moderators will go in and moderate something that hasn't been reported unless there is a need to. Many people won't agree, but we've always tried to operate a hands-off approach as much as possible to give people the freedom to express their own views. Some areas we've been successful with and other areas less so. I'm the first to admit as a website we've made some spectacular gaps in relation to angling politics discussions over the years. It's one of those can't do right from wrong things. I hope we've finally come up with a solution that works now by moving the angling politics discussions over to a new site that's more set up to its discussion than WSF ever was. The WSF forums have always been about catch reports, tackle, techniques, advice and a bit of banter where needed. It was never designed to cater for the heavy and dogged discussions that can often follow onion politics. The great news about the new setup is that WSF is attracting back members who left because of these discussions and traffic is increasing at higher levels. On the other side, the political discussions are generating much more interest than they ever did on WSF. It's still early days, but I'm hopeful. The internet will always attract trolls. Thankfully, we've been lucky on WSF over the past few years as the amount of troll activity has reduced significantly. Personally, I think this is because your average internet troll can get much more trolling done on Facebook or Twitter than they can do on a forum with its rules and controls. Lots of people think Facebook is going to be bad for forums, but I disagree, and this is one of the points that I often refer to as a good thing Facebook has done. Facebook, in my opinion, has increased the quality of forum posting whilst also eliminating trolling. We still get one or two trolls that break cover now and again, but for the most part, these are spotted in a few posts and are dealt with. The only problem we have is trolling that is done in stealth. What I mean here is trolling that is done via the private messaging system. We can't read private messages on WSF, so we don't know if it's going on unless a member of the forum tells us. Sadly, they often don't, but I'd appeal to any WSF members who have been evicted of trolling via the private channels to report those to the moderators and they will be dealt with. I'm not one to talk about politics, but one of the better things the coalition government has done is in the areas of internet trolling and online publication. Many forum owners have been crying out for a law that puts the onus of responsibility on the individual posting as opposed to the forum owner. And finally, we have something in law that gives us a degree of protection with the Defamation Act 2013, which has helped in part to move the UK's libel laws into the digital age. The RISF members use the forums for a multitude of things. First and foremost, for many anglers, it's about finding out what has been caught in their local area via the local catch report forums. Members can post text, photos and video of their catch reports from the website either via their computer or mobile device to show off their catches. Other members can then read these reports and also reply if they want to. The local area forums are also great places to ask advice if any angler is heading to an area that they are unfamiliar with. We need to do a lot of work in some areas to increase interest where there are already other established forums, but we have a number of plans to do this which will be rolled out over the next year. The forum also allows members to discuss a lot of niche topics within sea angling, within dedicated sections for tackle, baits, beginners, boat fishing, boat owning, lure fishing, fly fishing. 
We even have a section for how to prepare and cook your catch. We try to cover as many bases as we can and give each niche its own topic area. Although the amount of people who buy a product first and then ask if it's good on the forum still baffles me, the tackle forums are a great place to discuss tackle and ask opinions before you buy. We try to make it as much of a one-stop place for discussing Tianling across the UK and Ireland as it can be. One of the more interesting sections which is building up on WSF isn't actually a main forum at all, but a social group which is a forum member owned and run group concentrating on vintage fishing tackle. There are some fascinating discussions going on in this group about antique tackle and I'm genuinely amazed at some of the items people have picked up on there. Steve who runs this group has done a great job with it over the last year and he was recently promoted to a full-time WSF moderator. Away from the WSF site, we've set up the seaangling.org.uk website. Now this isn't going to be a site for everybody, but it deals with aspects of angling politics and conservation. We could never quite get it to work on WSF, and topics always used to spread to other areas of the site, and you'd have a wonderful catch report destroyed by a few choice words about some restriction or another. Some years ago, I thought of splitting the two subjects and having WSF as the angling angling site and a separate site for the heavy discussions that often revolve around angling politics. At that time I chose not to do it, but in February this year I bit the bullet and created a separate site. This site is structured so that it shows news, discussions directly related to recreational sea angling and an area for discussions relating to RSA and commercial fishing interests. This site gives people the freedom to really discuss what they think about developments in recreational sea angling politics and is for the most part unmoderated and directed by the members of the site. As I said, this site is not for everybody, but was an essential part of the evolution of WSF. When it comes to the overall importance of the forum on WSF, well, it is a big influence and a huge traffic generator. I'd hummed an art about introducing a forum for a number of years on the old seafishing.com site and for the first year of worldseafishing.com. In the end, I'm glad I did. A lot of people within the angling industry are very cautious and sceptical of forums, but there is no need to be. They should be far more worried about Facebook and Twitter and the comments people put on there as opposed to what is posted on the forum. Yes, there are some mysteries posted on forums occasionally. There are also people who talk with authority on subjects when they don't know what they're talking about. That is part and parcel of a forum and is no different to what anglers have been doing in pubs up and down the line for years. The fact is, the vast majority of forum posts are good, interesting and factual and they shouldn't be tainted by the tiny minority that aren't. But it was your brainchild, your baby. So talk us through how it all came about. One of the things I often get asked is if I've had any formal training with computer or online stuff. The quick answer is no. It was all self-taught and the person I have to thank for that is a guy called Colin Albert. Colin is one of my dad's best mates and one of the early adopters of the internet for angling. He was a member of various angling news groups and the author of the UK Sea Fishing FAQ in the mid-90s. Col was trained in all things IT by the BBC and he used to come out for long weekends not only to fish, but to upgrade and do any maintenance on Dad's computer. One weekend he came up laden with boxes and unbeknown to me, Dad was upgrading his computer. His old machine was going to become mine. Cole set up the machine for me, and he also installed a piece of software he thought I might enjoy using. It was called Hot Metal 2, and it was a HTML editor to create websites. My tinkering with Hot Metal 2, thanks to Cole, is the reason why I started tinkering with websites, and, ultimately, how WSF came to be. Mike Senior was sceptical of the idea of a website. Like many at the time, the idea of a free online magazine went against everything publishing was about. I don't think he thought it would last a year, but despite his sceptical outlook on the project, as a rebellious teenager, I ignored him and put together a prototype anyway. In the end, Dad said that if I wanted to pursue it, I should do, and he would lend me a hand initially to get some words together to launch it. I still don't think he was convinced it would be any more than a flash in the pan, but it didn't matter. I was up and running. The initial concept of the site was simple. It was a site that would cover the basic angling techniques and species that an angler would be most interested in reading about. The first site was very much tailored towards the beginner or intermediate angler that wanted to read how they could catch various species and learn new tactics and techniques to improve their angling. Whilst the site concept was put into motion in 1997, the date I used for its actual start is 1998. The first incarnation of the site wasn't pretty. It was very buggy and it took me 8 months of learning by trial and error to get something that worked properly. So the launch date I used is July 1998, which is when all of these issues were ironed out and I had the basis of a working site. 
At the time of the launch, the internet was still in its infancy. I was very lucky. I'd had the internet from a very early age purely because of the needs of my dad's job, but very few of my mates had it at home. We didn't have it in school either, so access for many was limited. From an angling point of view, things were even less developed. There were some sites out there that catered for anglers in a magazine-type format. Graham Marsden ran an excellent freshwater fishing magazine, and Elton Murphy was just in the process of starting up Anglersnet. JB, as we all used to know him, also started the NESA website, which was probably one of the first angling forums based on a bulletin board system and away from the traditional news groups and mailing lists that had been popular before. From the moment of launch, I was surprised at how quickly the site grew in terms of traffic. We had massive interest from America, where the internet was more evolved than in the UK at the time. Within the first month, I must have received over 30 emails from Americans asking about the techniques we used in Britain and how they might be adapted for use in America. Within the first three months, traffic was exceeding all expectations, and having saved up some pocket money, I invested in a domain name, seealltheangles.org.uk. Seeing the growth in traffic, Mike Senior took a bit more of an interest in the site, and when work allowed, he agreed to write a bi-weekly column for me called Mike's Gossip Column, detailing sea angling news, trade news, and any fishing stories he had. The Gossip Column went well, and it introduced a sticky element to the site, that meant people kept coming back. I managed to work out that I could afford the time to update the site every fortnight, and regular updating patterns only served to increase the traffic further. In 1999, I decided to change the name of the site to something more relevant. While See All The Angles sounded a bit different, it didn't really relate to what we were doing, and with search engines more focused on keywords, I registered the domain seafishing.com, and See All The Angles became seafishing.com. Seafishing.com grew massively in terms of content, and with this came extra exposure and notoriety. I think one of the proudest moments for me, and probably something that's going to stick with me forever, is when seafishing.com was featured on Yahoo as a site of the day. Yahoo may well have lost its way to Google now, but back in 1999, Yahoo was the biggest website on the planet bar none, and to be featured on their homepage for an entire day was the stuff of dreams, and with the exposure came a huge increase in traffic. The site registered a tenfold increase in traffic on the day Yahoo featured it, and soon after the press was starting to pick up on the site too, with features in the Times, the Telegraph, and also an internet magazine, which was kind of like a Radio Times for websites at the time. The site was also featured on ITV1's The Web Review Programme, and was reviewed by Richard Topping, the host, who gave the site a score of 8 out of 10. By 2000, the site was riding high, traffic was increasing all the time, and the amount of exposure it was getting across all forms of media was staggering. Of course, when you're riding high and not taking care of little things, mistakes do happen, especially in the fast-paced world of online. One of the biggest mistakes was actually how the site became known as WorldSeafishing.com. 2000 was a busy year for me both personally and work-wise. 2000 was the year I was sitting my A-levels. Although I had no intention of going to university, I wanted to do as well as I could just in case my other plans didn't work out. So in amongst the busy schedule at college, people had also seen what I'd done with the website and liked what I'd done. So I had started a web design agency too. This all left little time for looking after my own website, and somehow, to this day, I don't know how, I completely forgot to re-register the seafishing.com domain name. I only found out about this two days before the domain name was going to expire. Back then, domain registration was different, and when the name expired, it expired if you didn't register it within a certain time frame after expiry. It was 30 days out of time, and my site was about to be shut down. I spent hours on the phone trying to rectify the situation. In the end, I managed to secure the name again, but I wouldn't be able to use the seafishing.com name for 90 days. I had to find a new name, and fast. We used to get hundreds of emails, and whilst I was searching for a name, I remembered one email I'd had where somebody had described seafishing.com as the world of seafishing, and so worldseafishing.com was registered, and seafishing.com became worldseafishing.com, who people now refer to as WSF. WSF is not something I came up with. The site was always worldseafishing.com to me, but readers and lately forum members started referring to the site as WSF, and it stuck. So I've now incorporated that into the logo design. I was recently sent a marketing report that puts World Sea Fishing and the WSF keyword as the sixth most searchable brand name in UK angling online at the moment. Of course, the biggest thing to ever happen to WSF was the forum. The forum was a relatively late addition to the site and was launched in 2002 and subsequently relaunched in 2004 to its current format 
and is now the largest CNN forum in the UK. The site has evolved over the past 16 years and is now one of the most visited angling sites in the UK and Europe with over 200,000 unique visitors. This is more readers than all of the paper-based UK magazines combined. For much of its life, WSF has been personally funded by me. It wasn't until 2004 that WSF was registered as a business, and since then it has had to stand on its own two feet. 2005 was the year I became fully involved with WSF as a full-time job and enterprise, and this has been my full-time work for the past nine years. A lot of people assume that it's quite cheap to run a website, and it only costs a couple of quid a month. Unfortunately, this is not the case. When a site gets to a certain level of traffic, the cost starts to increase substantially. WSF currently runs two high-spec servers that run on tier 1 connections. We also have to find a maintenance fees to pay for system administration support to keep these servers running at their optimum 24-7, 365 days a year. There are also software, licensing and other administration costs that all go into running a high-traffic website. To cover these costs, I first tried the traditional advertising model. In 2005 and 2006, hardly anybody really understood or wanted to get involved in advertising, so I took an alternative route and set up a tackle shop linked to WSF. This did well for six years, but in the end I had a decision to make. My own life circumstances had changed. I'd moved in with my girlfriend and working 18 hours a day packing boxes wasn't my idea of fun or all that practical. The long days had also taken their toll on the website itself, which had largely been ignored in the last two years of retail. In March 2014, I took the decision to close the shop and went back to the advertising model, which, 10 years on, seems to be much more receptive. Advertising now covers all costs associated with the website and pays the wage of the guys who work on it and the contributors. Most of our advertising is non-angling, which guarantees the independence of our editorial. WSF is not the only website that I run. I have sites in other outdoor markets as well. I don't want to lose our angling spine though and I have plans for blog magazine type sites in the game, course and cart markets in time. I'm also working on a project that will bring anglers a new shopping experience online and there are a number of other projects that WSF team are working on within angling. I can't say too much about them at the moment but they should be released later in the year or the first quarter of 2016. So what exactly then is your day to day role? My day-to-day -day role is diverse and never the same. I'm the forum administrator and also the editor of the WSF magazine. My role in the magazine is create content as well as collect, edit and lay out content for our team of contributors. I also write a weekly newsletter and conduct all the marketing and promotional work. My forum role is that of administrator of the forums. I set the rules and help the moderators and the deputy administrator in their work to keep the forums running. Most of my work is technical behind the scenes and I rarely get a chance to do any moderating these days unless I'm needed. My business role basically encompasses everything within the whole of the business. With the ability now to look back, compare and contrast WSF 2015 with its first release. The site has evolved to a level that I didn't think possible when I first set it up. I was set up as a project, something to do on my holiday and hopefully learn a new skill. I never envisaged that it would become what it has become and there is no plan to take it to this level. I guess the major point of evolution for the site is becoming a Yahoo site of the day. This catapulted the site from relative obscurity to worldwide recognition in the space of 24 hours. It was really quite humbling that a site of Yahoo stature and prominence back then would take a pokey site created in a bedroom in North Wales and put it onto such a high pedestal. I don't think at the time I really realised what a big deal this was. Launching the forum was a radical step for WSF. It took what was a controlled, editorially driven site and pushed it into the unknown world of user-generated content. The amount of catch reports and topics that are circulating around the site on a daily basis is staggering. The magazine and forum have worked hand in hand for a number of years and have introduced thousands of new anglers into the sport, which is a great achievement. I'll be the first to admit I've made some mistakes throughout the course of building WSF. I've made some horrendous mistakes with the forum, particularly on the moderating side earlier on, purely because of naivety and the fact that I was trying to instill a forum direction as a mere whippersnapper onto users that were twice my age. Looking back, I've probably ironed out most of those mistakes now, but there are still a few that linger. I don't think any forum administrator who is truthful and honest would ever say that they get every decision right. That is impossible on a site that generates thousands of posts a day. My other regret is not putting as much emphasis into the WSF magazine once the forum and the shop were established. 
The WSF magazine could be so much better and we're one of the few sites that have the resources to truly make an online magazine work to the best of its abilities. This is something that has been rectified in recent times. When the site was first launched it was a collection of some 20 articles on different aspects of sea angling. Now the site has well over 1500 articles relating to sea angling and the forum contains 700,000 threads and nearly 5 million posts. Our traffic levels when we first started were counted in hundreds a day. Now we're having a bad day if we don't reach over 100,000. The gulf between the original site and this one is massive, but the site is still evolving and will continue to evolve for as long as it exists. And of course, the next obvious question has to be, where is WSF headed in the future? The big thing for me is to get the WSF magazine back to where it used to be. I've done a lot of work on this over the past 12 months, but there is still a lot more to do. Over the past six months I've introduced new practices and processes so that all of our contributors are fully informed as to what they need to be doing and when their articles are to be published. I've been talking to various tackle shops and tackle manufacturers to make sure that we have a constant supply of review kit coming in. I'm working on plans that will enable the WSF magazine to increase its update range from three times a week to one full article, how-to, story or review posted every single day and hopefully sometimes twice a day. The plan is to make the WSF magazine the very best it can be with a good mix of contributors and a good balance of content that appeals to a broader range of CMs as possible. I'm also working on plans to internationalise WSF. Plans are already afoot on a US version with a view to producing an Australian New Zealand version after. There is also going to be a large and comprehensive worldwide travel guide that will be plugged into the main site that will give tips for both angling and other activities to a number of angling destinations across the globe. It's something I get asked for a lot and I'm having great fun building it too. The destination guide should be up and running in 2015 and the US and Australian sites hopefully by late 2015 into early 2016. I've recently invested quite a bit in camera gear and video is something I'm looking at quite heavily. And the problem is I'm used to in front of a camera so I may well have to employ Mike Senior for that role but video is really something that I'm keen to move forward with. The biggest shift over the past year has been towards mobile. I'm constantly trying to work on creating a better mobile experience as I think this is the way a lot of articles are going to be consumed in the future. Our last redesign of the forums and the magazine brought in a mobile first design so the whole site works natively on a mobile phone and then expands to work on a tablet and desktop too. One area I haven't touched on yet is your own involvement in fishing. Your history, preferences and possibilities having such a well-known dad. Well, Dad took me for my first fishing expedition when I was three. Um, I actually wanted to go sooner, but I don't think my mum was all too keen on me wading on a beach while I was still in nappies. Eventually, I went out as a three-year-old using some dodgy yellow rod that Dad had brought back from him when he used to live in Australia, and I caught a flatfish on my very first trip. That was my first fish. That got me hooked for life, and incidentally, I caught this fish from a mark less than half a mile away from where my dad caught his first fish. Ever since then I've done a variety of different fishing, up until I was 14 most of my fishing was done in Wales in a relatively close area. I fished my home beaches near Barmouth and Tallinn and when I was old enough to rock fish I used to accompany my dad on his trips to the scene for conger and huss. Eventually I started to boat fish with some regularity but it was my first trip to Ireland that really kicked started my boat fishing. Fishing with guys like Norman Dunlop really opens your eyes to different techniques and also to fishing for different species. Fishing in Ireland with my dad and Norman taught me a lot and I'm indebted to both of them for the knowledge that they passed on. Ireland is a special place for me and I always make sure I visit once a year. Until 2008, dad and I used to regularly go to Ireland twice a year, but work interfered for me and I haven't been able to get over with him since. Now my Irish trips are limited to fishing the Ross Lair Small Boats Festival each year with Team Seamistress skipper by Terry Hill. It's a great experience and a good laugh and I recommend the festival to any small boat angler looking to get out. I'm a species nut and up until I started with the retail business I was doing okay. My overall list was up to 59 species in the UK and Ireland. I've added hardly any for 8 years but now I have a bit more time on my hands and I have my work-life balance right. I'm looking forward to seriously going out and hitting the species list hard. I doubt I'll get close to Dad's 100 plus that he's on now but I'd like to. Internationally i fished a few places, i fished Norway a few times and absolutely loved it out there, such an amazing place with great fishing. Iceland as well is a wonderful country, amazing people and the fishing is again outstanding. I fly fish in Sweden and in January I went to Florida to work for a few days where I managed to do a bit of fishing. Didn't catch anything massive but I fell in love with the place, it's an angling paradise and I can't wait to get back there again. 
Locally I've moved to Anglesey recently and I'm just getting used to the area. I'm looking forward to getting some lure fishing in this year and I'm planning to hit some of the big rock marks too. I'm also hoping to get out on some evening trips aboard Gethinir in my way to get some boat fishing hours in. I've tried to arrange my work so I can get out fishing more this year. Hopefully it will work. It might surprise a lot of people to know that I'm actually in love with fly fishing. Fly fishing is my first love and I've recently joined the local syndicate water which contains brown trout and apparently some sea trout too and I'm really looking forward to getting out on those in the evenings. Back to WSF now for the final question. With so much information now available instantly at the touch of a button, is the writing on the wall for books and magazines, or will some people always want a hard copy? I absolutely believe in the future of books and magazines as hard copy alternatives. I totally disagree with anybody sounding the death knell of the printed word in hard copy. There is room for both digital and hard copy. I'm not going to say that every magazine on the shelf today is going to survive, as I don't think they will. I think some consolidation will happen in not too distant future. It's happened before in my lifetime and it will happen again soon. Whilst magazine sales are falling, they will eventually come to a plateau and stop falling and hold steady. The big magazines have seen a significant drop in their sales, but with the greatest respect to them, they only have themselves to blame. Many of the magazines are slow to pick up on new ideas. They rely on old formats that worked 15 years ago and didn't respond quick enough when they no longer worked. Some magazines still carry catch reports. I have no idea why. These can be found online, up to date and up to the minute. Magazines will survive. They just need to adapt to the times we're living in. They should leave the live stuff, like reports, to online. It does a far better, quicker and cheaper job than they ever can. Magazines will always excel in their production values. A picture of a nice coin in a full DPS format will always win against a thousand by thousand pixel shot online. As for books, I own a Kindle and I use it often. But for some situations, you simply can't beat the hard copy book. Kindles are great for novels, but for instructional books and books you want to refer to all the time, I don't think they can compete with a physical book. I've just had the dilemma of buying a book about fly tying. I purchased the Kindle version first, hated the layout, and it was very hard to read. I went out the next day and got the hard copy version, and it is possibly one of the best books I've ever read on fly tying and techniques. So in a nutshell, I think the market still has plenty of space for both online, Kindle and the physical hard copies of books and magazines. Hmm, not sure I entirely agree with that one. I think it's probably a generation thing, with younger people more likely to become openly accepting of electronic information than old timers like me. So in that regard, I'm surprised that you're the one who thinks that hard copy has a future, whereas I'm the one that doesn't, or at best is limited to reference libraries and the like. But with such an age gap between us, I don't think I'll be around to hear you say I told you so. Either way, my thanks then to Mike Thrussell Jr. for giving us the historical lowdown on WSF. <laughs>